Right, His Excellency, former President, honored guests, fellow Africans, it's great to be able to share this with you. And I guess I'm from a scientific background, I talk science and technology, so I tend to be used to using a bit of technology here. So just bear with me for a minute or two, and I hope it will make the uh, presentation go a whole lot better. Right, I'd like to ask you to imagine that we're turning the clock back 50,000 years. So this building disappears, the lights disappears, the cameras disappear, you're sitting on a rock or a log, your clothes disappear. And you're probably here in a part of the world which is known as the cradle of humankind. And as you're sitting around the campfire, what are you talking about? You're probably saying, well, um, how can, where does fire come from? How can I find stuff that burns better? Or maybe you're discussing the hunt, tomorrow's hunt, and you're going to say, what are the impala going to be doing? And how can I improve my technique so that I can hunt that animal better? Or perhaps you'll be talking about, um, uh, let's see, um, what kind of rock do I need to find in order to make a better spear or a better stone axe? And so these are questions of science. How does the world work and how can we change it? How can we master it in order to make our lives easier? And those are the, some of the fundamental questions of science and technology. And those questions were asked first here in Africa and they were answered here in Africa. And it's also scientists that are digging in this cradle of humankind and finding fossils like this like this Australopithecus sediba, that give us an idea of our origins, where we actually come from. And I also have, uh, had a bit of a hand in the game there. One of the mysteries of this fossil is it was is incredibly well-preserved and very intact. And the idea is that it perhaps it fell down what we call a death trap and got washed away into these underground caves, and that is why it was preserved. And I was part of a team that did some caving there to try to find modern-day death traps that could be analogues for that. Exactly four weeks ago, I was in Egypt. And, and, and of course, as our ancestors moved from Africa, from the African Rift Valley, and our geneticists tell us that this is where the humankind originated, they passed along the valley of the Nile. And it is there that agriculture started, and people had enough surplus, enough time to start to develop art, culture, science, and great engineering structures like these pyramids. I went to the town of Aswan, over there on the the left-hand side, you can see the tomb of the Aga Khan. But I was there to go and visit the Aswan High Dam. And that dam was built in the 1960s, a collaboration between the Russians and the Egyptians. At that time, the largest dam in the world. When you create such a large body of water, you put a load on the earth and you trigger earthquakes. And that is a concern. If you had a big earthquake near that dam wall, it could rupture and that would be absolutely catastrophic. And that is... Um, uh, so a seismic network was set up there to study this reservoir-induced seismicity. I went there because I'm interested in that. Here in South Africa, we have the world's deepest mines, and we make earthquakes here. And sadly, they've led to the deaths of many people in the last century. I also am here to talk a little bit about the International Council for Science, that's this ICSU. And they have a regional office for Africa here, and I'm involved in that. The ICSU was founded in 1931, and of course, it was dominated by the large and powerful nations. Um, in Africa, about 27 odd uh, African or 29 African countries belong to, the, to ICSU. And their goal, of course, is to strengthen science for the benefit of society. The role of the regional offices, and the first one was established here in sub Saharan Africa with its headquarters here in Pretoria in 2005. But the role of these regional offices is to ensure that the voice of developing countries influences the international agenda and also that we as scientists from the developing countries set these priorities. The other uh, 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 regional offices are in Latin America and the Caribbean, and often we find there are just these weak links between the researchers, the scientists, the teachers, and industry and academia. One of the roles of the, uh, of the science officers was, of course, to identify the problems that we could address with science and technology here in Africa. And we came up with four priority areas. The one being global and environmental change. If our climate changes significantly and sub-Saharan Africa is the part of the world that is predicted to be most severely hit, it will change our patterns of farming, our population. It will have a big impact on our continent. Human health and well-being. Africa has a crisis of diseases such as malaria, <laughs> HIV, AIDS. Also, natural hazards and disasters. And I was the secretary of that particular scoping group. And lastly, the need for sustainable energy in Africa. What are the problems that really face Africa? Well, in terms of natural hazards and disasters, of course, flooding. Areas like Mozambique are prone to floods every now and again. 
The Horn of Africa and the Sahel region is prone to droughts and famine. And we cannot neglect the geohazardous world, such as the volcanoes that erupted in the Great Lakes region of, the, of, of, of East Africa. I'm involved with a program called Africa Array. And this is a program that was established about 10 years ago. And our ambition here is to develop infrastructure, relationships, and do research across Africa, and to have African scientists working on African problems in Africa. Africa is a fantastic continent from a geological point of view. We have world-class mineral deposits, the gold deposits of the Vatvatisrod Basin, the platinum deposits, which is now being fought over, but just north of us here. We have the Katanga copper, uh, copper fields. We have the diamond mines. We have many rich resources. And in recent years, oil has been, and hydrocarbons have been discovered in increasing quantities in the basins of Africa. Africa Array has established a whole network of now more than 50 geophysical observatories in sub-Saharan Africa. You'll see there are no political boundaries there. Geological formations just cross the boundaries. And these both record seismicity, earthquakes, but they also record weather, they record things like atmospheric moisture. And over here we are using this data to do studies that are directed, some just towards pure curiosity, but others to issues like climate change, atmospheric science, space weather, geohazards, the search for resources. Let's just see. But also as part of the Africa Ray program, it's a community. We get together every year in Johannesburg for about two weeks to share our science, to plan work, to do training. Here some of the fellows have been trained, trained in how to use the equipment. Also every year we run uh, training courses, two a year, to, uh, to mid-level career people, uh, professionals, to, in how to I suppose, govern and better govern the mining industry. We also, every year, run a field school over here in South Africa, but we have people coming from the US, uh, from uh, minority groups, Hispanics and African Americans, and also from the rest of Africa to learn how to practically use field equipment in the field. And of course, we focus on postgraduate researchers. Research, these are two of my students that graduated last November. And then at the next level, of course, we have the postdoctoral students. We have three in our program right now, from Cameroon, from Tanzania, and from Madagascar. And now just a few words of the kind of science we do. We use earthquakes to explore the interior of the earth, and we have many different toolboxes that we can use. And you can imagine this. This is much like being put into a, a CAT scanning machine where you have x-rays bombarding you, and from that you can work out the structure of your internal body. You can find out what, uh, if you've got a slipped disc, for example. And we do the same thing with the earth, only it's a lot bigger patient, and we use as the sources of energy are earthquakes. And what we're trying to work out, for example, is how does the, I suppose, the dynamo of the earth work? What makes mountains? How do the continents collide? What makes earthquakes? And so, for example, in this study, we put out our seismic stations in many different campaigns over many different years here in this region of East Africa. And during that time, we recorded earthquakes from all over the world. And as these rays came in underneath the continent, we were able to form our tomographic images, our tomograms over here, to understand things, some very fundamental things about the way the Earth works. And of course, here in Africa, we don't just have to do applied research. It's wonderful to do Earth, uh, do, do science that feeds our curiosity. But we also work here in regions where there are great needs. One being this, uh, this example of Goma in the, volcanic, uh, in the Great Lakes region. This is another one of our students, George Mavonga, who comes who works at the Goma Volcanic Observatory. And there's the signboard in the, in the town. Uh, that yellow flag indicates there's just a moderate risk of a volcanic eruption. But he worked on, for his PhD, he, he, we put seismometers on that mountain, and you're actually able to track the way in which the magma moves from deep within the Earth's crust to the caldera and see, get a warning of a few days or a few weeks before it erupts. Also in that region, you get earthquakes from time to time. And part of what George did was to work out a seismic hazard assessment map for that region, which has been used by mining companies working in that region, where they should place their waste dumps and slimes dams, but also by the International Commission for the Red Cross as to where they should place refugee uh, settlements and new towns. So finally over here, this is my last slide, I chose a picture of the Earth, because that's what I study, taken from space and taken at night. And the first thing that you'll see over here is Africa is relatively dark compared to Europe. In Africa, there are not many large cities over here that, um, that give forth light, and that might be seen as a measure of our lesser development. I'm sure that's true. On many standards of development, we're not as advanced as, 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 as the North. 
But on the other hand, we can see over here that we're not burning that energy. It's not just being wasted in that same way. And early on, we spoke about Africa being the cradle of humankind and also Africa being the cradle of civilization. And now I think it's time for us really to get out of that cradle and to rise up out of the cradle, I think as an earlier speaker would have said over here, and work together to join those points of light. And an interesting thing is when you're a late developer like us, you've got some advantages. You can learn from the mistakes of others. We can avoid squandering the natural resources that aren't renewable. We can also leapfrog and skip out stages in technology. We don't have to use copper wire. We can go straight to optic fiber or to, to wireless. Um, there, there are some advantages here that in late follows, and we still have a large amount of the world's available mineral and agricultural resources within our soil, within our continent. And it's up to us to make sure it's used wisely and well. So finally, I think it's just as we try to communicate and form these um, communities of, of scientists, it's perhaps quite interesting that the way in which, we, of course, we do it is using the internet and using Skype. And one of the inventors, perhaps, of the, the most widely used operating system in the Linux family is Mark Shuttleworth. He's an African and uh, the first African in space, but he chose to, cause, to call this operating system that he led. He led the development, but this is an open source, it's a free, it's a community development, and he chose to call it the Ubuntu system. And in a way, that kind of characterizes, I believe, what we have to achieve as scientists, as engineers, as technologists in Africa, working together to solve African problems. Thank you.